Let's do this one last question here. It's from Evan. What learnings from deep work would you apply to the movement for racial justice going on right now? Well, Evan, I think we can all agree that I probably don't have a lot of specific advice to give about the particular movement happening now because it's not a movement in which people think of me as an expert and rightly so, but I, I do have some advice more generally to give about the role of things like deep work and deep thoughts in social movements or large movements in general, as this is something I have done some studying of. Now, one thing I'm really convinced about is that deep problems, historically speaking, almost always require deep thought as a precondition for their solution. Now, this is something that, that worries people sometimes, and I understand why. Let's, let's go through the worries. So some people get concerned that believing that you need to do some really serious or deep thinking to, to really get your arms around a problem, that that somehow diminishes the severity of the problem. That somehow if you say, look, this requires some deep thinking, that that means that the problem itself is somehow nuanced. Or maybe there's good people on both sides or that, you know, this is not an obvious what the right answer is here. And that's not at all true. In fact, I want to argue, if we go back historically, we can, we can see case after case of problems where there are egregious obstacles. And there is no doubt, especially looking back, there is no doubt on what the right side of the issue is. And yet, those on the right side still require deep thinking to figure out how are we going to take this egregious obstacle and actually demolish it. Like, let's get historical here. History is where I'm a little bit more comfortable. Let's get historical here. Let's go back to Cicero. Let's go back to Cicero's or, uh, his oration against Catalina. Right? This is back in 63 BC. Lucius Catalina was leading a plot to overthrow the Roman Senate. To basically let's, let's get rid of the Republic and allow an, an emperor, dictator, to rule. And Cicero, I mean, he knew deep in his bones, as well as he knew anything else, that this was not good. The, the, the fall of the Republic would not be good. It wasn't a nuanced thing for him. He didn't have to think deeply about what's the right answer here. He knew that in his bones. But his oration, which is a classic in human rhetorical tour de force, it's like a, a, a sort of a classic rhetorical um, exemplar. Man, that took a lot of deep thinking. It's a beautiful oration, incredibly carefully structured. Where he's taking this instinct that he believes as clearly as anything else in his life that, that Catalina is wrong, and it took a lot of deep thinking to try to make it clear why that is true, and we still look back at that oration today. Let's take something equally as obvious. Slavery in the U.S., a, a, a black mark on our history. It obviously an egregious wrong. Let's think about Abraham Lincoln confronting this egregious long. Look at the Lincoln Douglas debates. This is Lincoln now as a public figure who's out there, who's making these arguments. He's doing these debates in front of very large audiences against Stephen Douglas. And they're making, they're having these big debates, and this is about the Nebraska Act, but, but the, the point is, it's a big debate about trying to stop the expansion of slavery. Now, Lincoln, you know, famously said, if slavery is not wrong, then nothing is wrong. By this point in his moral development, there was nothing that he was more sure about than that slavery was an evil. But it took a lot of deep thinking to put together his side in the Lincoln-Douglas debate so that he could begin to deconstruct Douglas's argument, to find the chinks in that armor, to lay the moral foundation for what he knew in his bones was absolutely wrong, but it took a lot of work. In fact, it turns out if you look back at Lincoln's moral development, the thing that made him a national anti-slavery figure, it was actually when he first got elected to Congress, not because being in Congress put him on a national stage, because it didn't. He was, he was there for one term and was not a, not a figure of any import while he was in the Congress. He gave sort of one big speech, the famous spot speech, that was a bit of an embarrassment. He was ridiculed for it, and he lost his seat. So why did being in Congress for one term, why was that the foundation for his career as a national anti-slavery advocate? Because he got access to the Library of Congress. And so Lincoln, who was, you know, hoarding 
the small number of books he could find, you know, when he was growing up in Illinois, now he had access to one of the big libraries in this country and he began to read. And it was in this reading, this, this uh, exhaustive, relentless research he began to do to understand the origins, the political origins of the slavery issue in America. What really did the Constitution say? What were these earlier compromises built on? Where is the actual like, political legitimacy here? He, he went and did the deep thinking. It led to his first breakout speeches like the Cooper Union Address, which were considered one of his first really good speeches. And it led him on the trajectory to Stephen Douglas. And he was able to really hold his own against Stephen Douglas, which, which is like, you know, um, the lightweight going up against a heavyweight in the boxing match. He was able to hold his own in these four hour debates because he had done the work and he'd done the thinking and he was able to just pick apart the moral legitimacy of Douglas's argument. Again, if slavery is not wrong, then nothing is wrong. He felt it in his bones at that point. But the deep thinking on the issue is what helped him actually act on that. Let's look to Martin Luther King, right? 1963, Birmingham, right? He's arrested in Birmingham, along with Abernathy and and a lot of other people that he was involved with. And he's put in this jail in Birmingham in his terrible conditions. Relatively early on in the fight for civil rights. And he's he's in this jail cell in Birmingham, and, and one of his supporters gets him a newspaper, an Alabama newspaper, where there's this article in it called A Call for Unity. And it was written by eight white clergymen who were making sort of the, the standard white racist argument of the time about, look, you shouldn't be agitating. There shouldn't be outsiders down here. We have, we have our way of doing things and then we have a court system, whatever, whatever. It was like, it was their, their big argument for like why King and the, the uh, why King and his organization, the related organization shouldn't be down there. They shouldn't be protesting. It's not good. And this really upset King, but he's stuck here in this jail cell. So he starts thinking, he's doing deep work under terrible conditions. And at first he's writing on scraps of paper that are being smuggled into him by his supporters when they come to visit. And eventually they find a loophole where, okay, he's allowed to have legal pads because of his, to take notes for his meetings with his lawyers. So now he can start writing on legal pads and he really works through his thinking. And you get the letter from the Birmingham jail, which is foundational for all the civil rights movement that follows, right? King, of course, knew in his bones that what was happening in the South was wrong. There was no doubt about it. But the time for deep work and deep thinking is what allowed him to actually articulate that argument in a way that could take reactionary critiques like a call for unity and completely deconstruct them. And it was foundational, foundational for the movement that followed. All right, so let me step back for a second. What I'm arguing here is uh, to say that when you feel affronted by a condition of the world, when you feel drawn instinctually and magnetically to a cause, to then add to that instinct, I want to think deeply and I want to read deeply and I want to contemplate deeply about this issue, That is not a dismissal of the urgency of the issue. It's actually an affirmation of the urgency. If you really take an issue seriously, at some point, you have to think deeply about it because otherwise you're just floating around on the surface and things on the surface can get blown around quite easily. All right, so let's get back to the question at hand. So what should you do? Well, read hard books, read books that come at the issue from different angles, Let this hard, careful reading collide. You know, we talked about this earlier in this podcast. I've talked about this in other podcasts, but this this notion of letting uh, hard ideas collide, that's what lays down the deep roots, the deep intellectual roots, the deep intellectual roots that Cicero built on, that Lincoln built on, that MLK built on, and allows you to actually grow this sort of intellectual tree on which you can build real understanding, real commitment, real clarity, and real action. So that's what I think you should do is, I want to understand this issue. Let me read the best things written about this issue. And let me read the best critiques of these things been written about this issue. And let me let those things collide because I want to have roots that I trust. And what happens if you don't do this? Well, if you don't do this, you might just end up on Twitter. 
we've talked about this before. Twitter, from an intellectual perspective, is a very shallow world. It's inherent in the medium. I've gone through this Neil Postman critique that I've applied to Twitter, but essentially the conclusion of this critique is the medium is the message. And in this case, the message that the medium of Twitter delivers is that the world is very simple. There's terrible people and great people. You want to be on the great people's team and you want to dunk on the terrible people. That's all Twitter offers, but that's not enough. You don't have deep intellectual roots. And so you'll eventually just become exhausted or you might get kind of pushed around in the points of view that don't really, aren't really congruent with what you actually believe or with, with the truth, or you just move on. Like Twitter cannot deliver philosophy. You have to cultivate philosophy. And if you feel seriously about an issue, you need to cultivate that philosophy. So that's my argument here. I think deep thinking is how you approach deep problems if you want a sustainable, morally clear, and really effective solution. So read hard things, have challenging conversations, and put aside time for just raw thinking, just raw reflection, trying to make sense of what you read, how you feel about it, how it all makes sense. Resist the urge for easy solutions. It's not enough to just jump on Twitter and join a team and take your marching orders and do some dunking while in line at the store and then feel like you've done your part. If you wanna transform your soul, if you wanna to try to transform the world, you actually have to do the work. You have to do the thinking. It is absolutely worth it. I've argued this about many parts of the deep life. And I think when it comes to social progress, there's no better example of a place where the power of deep undistracted thinking is really needed. So Evan, thank you for that question. I think it gave me a chance to talk a lot, of, a lot about some more general issues. I've been thinking about a lot about the role of deep thinking in different aspects of life. And I think we'll leave it at that. I think that's as good of a place as any to end. So, you know, thank you everyone who sent in your questions. I'm going to do my best to do another mini episode a little bit later this week. And then otherwise I should be back next Monday with the next full length episode feedback or comments can go to interesting at calnewport.com. If you want to contribute an audio question, please go to speakpipe.com slash calnewport. I will be soliciting more text-based questions on my mailing list soon, so you can sign up there at calnewport.com. In the meantime, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing. Please consider leaving a rating and a review. And until next time, as always, stay deep. <laughs>